The recording is. Brilliant. Fantastic. And welcome to you all. We are just delighted you're here for this webinar on connecting architecture to data for intelligent strategy execution. It is such an honor to be here with you, Asif. I'm really important, excited to talk about this important topic of intelligent strategy execution and to connect the ideas from our two books. So maybe we start with some introductions. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Fendi. And it's a pleasure to be partnering on this webinar with you. So welcome everyone. Good evening, good morning, or good afternoon or late night somewhere in the world. Uh, welcome to our first webinar, our joint webinar. My name is Asif Gill. I'm associate professor at the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm also head of discipline of software engineering. And also I do my own uh, consulting as well as a principal consultant on architecture. And uh, tonight uh, or today uh, in general, I would say that night for me here in Sydney, I'm dialing from Sydney, Australia. And uh, recently the reason of that being coming together is that uh, the books we have launched last year, uh, Wendy and I, uh, adaptive Enterprise Architecture as Information, which is a kind of a, my book, and Strategy to Reality, uh, Wendy's book. So we'll be sharing snippets from this book and having a very casual, interactive discussion with you guys. So over to you, Wendy. Take it away. Perfect. Well, just a, a quick introduction. So Wendy, I am a longtime business architecture practitioner, thought leader, educator, have practiced the discipline from just about every angle you can um, Imagine from having been the enterprise-wide business architect of top to bottom transformation to using the discipline for startups. So very passionate about um, the possibilities. Um, I am also a business architecture guild co-founder, and uh, I have the honor of working with individuals around the world to advance careers and, um, and to work with organizations to help them build strategic business architecture practices. So uh, just a tiny bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you're wondering, we will uh, be sharing this video and happy to share slides as well. And please put your questions in the chat. We'll cover them uh, during and or at the end. We definitely want to hear from you. So with that, uh, see if I'm going to get started. So our agenda today, I will first lay out really the strategic business case for end-to-end -end strategy execution and how we can underpin that with enterprise architecture. And then Asif will talk about how do we actually make that real with adaptive enterprise architecture as information and creating intelligent strategy execution with enterprise architecture as information. So we'll get started here. So as Asif mentioned, I wrote a book called Strategy to Reality, and turning big ideas into action is truly a, a big area of passion uh, for me. But what does that really mean? Right? What does it really mean to successfully go from strategy to execution? And I like to think about that as two things. The first is defining clear strategic intent, because that's what we're translating. That's what we're building upon. And then second, being able to translate that intent into organized effort across people, process, technology, potentially across a very large scale within our organizations of different organizational structures, legal entities, products, geographies, and being able to do that with transparency, accountability, and intentional change management for people. So really the idea is how do we build a cohesive end-to-end -end capability or muscle in our organizations to do strategy to execution. And why that's so important is we all know, right? Um, I like to say organizations must do change, must do continuous change well, because of, you know, we're we're not just transforming today and then we're done tomorrow and it's status quo for 10 years. We know we have continual change to react to in disruption. And you know, just looking at the volume of transformation that some of our organizations are doing today, we're working in business ecosystems. So effective strategy execution is 
competitive advantage, right? We may not always think about it like that, um, but it is. Or if you work in government or nonprofit, effective strategy execution helps you to better serve your constituents and achieve your mission and leverage your precious resources. So if you think of sort of a funnel as I have there of, of change, right, and business ideas, we need to be able to rationalize them and in an organized way, get them from idea into delivered initiative and solution. And so we'll come back to that a little bit more. And, you know, maybe to, to sum up a little bit of the challenge, I think there's a couple good quotes here. And the first one reminds us that we can have the most brilliant strategy, the most competitively advantaged business model, but if we can't get those ideas into action, it kind of doesn't matter how good and smart it was in the first place, right? If the organization works at cross purposes or people aren't sure how to execute the strategy, people aren't internally aligned. So just underscoring the importance of this strategy to execution muscle. Or another quote from, um, from Richard Romalt, that a good strategy has coherence and organizations don't always have that. Sometimes we have goals, initiatives that may symbolize progress, but not a coherent approach to accomplishing that progress other than spend more and try harder. So those are the ideas that, uh, that we're really going to double click into. So enterprise architecture is a critical enabler of strategy execution. And we've seen um, We've seen a lot of traction gained worldwide around this idea in organizations actually doing this. And business architecture as one domain of enterprise architecture, as Seif will talk about the others and go into more detail, but business architecture as the tip of the spear for enterprise architecture is really important to help us bridge between strategy and execution. And as you see here, the contemporary practice of business architecture really bridges two worlds, right? It's really a bit of a Venn diagram where business architecture is absolutely part of the enterprise architecture umbrella, but it's also arguably a missing aspect of strategic management to give us this role, to give us a, a way to translate strategy cohesively to give us an integrative role and framework to work across our silos and a common vocabulary. We know this to be more important than ever before working across silos. And as Asif is gonna share, to give us decision support as we go. So again, Asif will talk about the bigger view of enterprise architecture, but just to sort of double click on the business architecture, Business architecture is comprised of 10 domains, as many of us uh, may, uh, may, may already know. Um, at the heart of that are capabilities and value streams and based on defined information concepts. That really gives us the foundation of the business architecture and our macro level business building blocks. And then we can connect them to strategies, metrics, initiatives, stakeholders, policies, products, and then also connect to domains in other disciplines as well. Let's see, question, do we have a question? Yeah, uh, Wendy, we have a question uh, on your previous slide. So as it's very interactive and informal, we can take it as it comes through. So the question is, how do you see the BRM, which is a business relationship management role fit into this picture? Fantastic question. Um, I think there's such a tight partnership between BRMs and business architects. And I think BRMs are on that strategic management side and are one of the very important consumers. Uh, and I also say informers of business architecture to work with the business and help translate strategy into action, leveraging business architecture as part of that. Fantastic question. And it's a very important partnership. Yeah. It's another one, Wendy, for you. It's certainly a very interesting point you raised and the raising question. So um, do you think financial analysts, analysts are recognizing good strategy execution versus bad and incorporating that in the enterprise valuations? Great question. I, I honestly, I think we're, I think we're at the beginning of a, of a wave of understanding of the importance of cohesive strategy execution 
but I think we have a long way to go, honestly, um, particularly from the financial angle. I, I do love that question. Uh, Asif, I don't know if you want to comment on that one, but I feel like there's still a lot more awareness to go. I feel like that happens in pockets that I see. Um, I, I think in the data driven approach, what many we are looking at now, I mean, certainly the financial analyst has a bigger role in play. And uh, I will call the business analysts as well from the BI side of point of view, they have a big role as well in putting their uh, because in the end of the day, it's about outcomes. And most of the time, we measure those as a financial outcomes. So certainly. Yeah, right on. Great questions. Any others to see? Yeah. Over to you. <laughs> Brilliant. So business architecture, as is all architecture, holistic, multidimensional view of an organization. So, um, you know, because business architecture is going to frame uh, the, the enterprise architecture, it's so important that it represents the entire organization is business driven, business owned, and is high level in detail. Again, it's the forest, it can connect to the trees, but it is really that macro level view, which is why it's so powerful to, um, to make this connection point. So to go a little bit further now and how architecture does connect strategy and execution, an overall view here, we can think about sort of an iterative flow of strategy can drive changes to an organization's architecture. That architecture is going to translate and frame those changes for execution. Um, and by the way, in, in this conversation, waterfall agile, like um, from, 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 from this perspective, as I'm sharing, it's um, I'm, I'm at a higher level, right? So, so agnostic of that. Execution then will improve our architecture, for example, enhancing the way that we enable capabilities today. And then furthermore, architecture informs and refines strategy. So more to come. And just a little bit tactically, if we think about what our current state architecture looks like, we can show evolutions to that in target state architecture blueprints to reflect how is it evolving from strategy and other changes. And then that becomes the new current state of the organization. And again, initiatives are going to actually deliver on the changes to make that future state architecture real. So now let's go a little bit deeper here. Um, I have a strategy to execution framework. Again, not waterfall agile. It's a real macro level view of just the big things we do. And a challenge for many organizations is that we go from stage one, the big ideas, the strategies, and we, we skip over stage two and we translate them into our response to those strategies, to initiatives, solutions, shaping work without really taking the enterprise view on it. And that's the big opportunity. And if we skip over that stage two, where we architect changes collectively, that's when we end up with things like redundant solutions in tech debt, or fragmented you know, customer and partner and employee experiences, or potentially doing a lot of wonderful work, but we don't really know if it moved the needle on the business outcomes that we were trying to achieve in the first place. So the key takeaway here is that there is a stage two as we translate strategy to execution. And the role of architecture is to inform strategy, to help us identify and harmonize the changes in stage two. I'm going to go even one step further on how we do that on the next slide. And then architecture helps to framework at a macro level. And it gives us this golden thread from strategy to architecture to the initiatives and solutions so that we can, for example, understand are the initiatives executing today? Are they actually aligned with our strategies? Or if our strategy changes because of We've seen a lot of disruption, even just in the last years. If we have to pivot and we change the strategy, what does that do to the architecture and, and the initiatives, right? So you have sort of this flexible and agile golden thread. And just through the business architecture lens here, because that's going to frame the rest of the enterprise architecture, um, here's a, a bit more look at that golden thread. So remember I said there's two key pieces to translate strategy, and that is clear intent translated into organized effort. And so in the blue columns there, that's where we unpack the clear intent. 
goals, objectives, metrics, course of action, whatever your strategic management framework is that you're using. And then to translate into coordinated action, we're going to uh, do that through the value streams and capabilities, our macro level business building blocks that will help us connect the dots and understand where that change is happening, frame high level people process technology changes. And then the key, the opportunity here is to look across our value stream and capability changes and then shape the work, not to go from the strategy to the work, but essentially orient the work around value streams and capabilities, which gives us a, a, a different way to own and invest in the work and a smarter way to use resources. So we have some questions. Uh, yes, Fanny, we have a couple of questions on the previous slide as well, leading to this. So when you say architecture, uh, are you mm -hmm. referring to EA or a business architecture? That's the first one. EA as business and IT architecture, however you define the IT architecture, so app data tech. So absolutely, I'm talking about enterprise architecture, but the collection of business and IT architecture, all the domains. Yeah. Okay. okay. And the second question is, uh, this uh, looks like an IT value chain uh, to support a business and IT aligned operating model. This is not IT for a second. And I spend most of my days talking to business leaders with this particular view here. Um, this is utterly about the business and it's utterly about how do we get all sorts of teams and I'm, we're only focusing on the architecture today, but how do the teams work together to actually make ideas real? So this actually couldn't be any more business focused. That's really the lens at which I'm I'm coming at it. Of course, we all play our role and IT is an important enabler, but uh, but it's uh it's it's meant to be a business view indeed. Indeed. I, I think there's another uh, question relevant to that context, is that uh, which is a question for both of us. Uh, when you are ready, when, uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, I'm reading that question when we are ready. We are ready to answer that question. So uh, when we speak to enterprise architecture, uh, enterprise architecture, uh, when, we, when we speak to enterprise architecture, do you separate business EA and IT EA? Or do you see EA as, a, as the whole business? Yeah, and see if I, I just to like kind of reinforce mine, and then you may have a different take on it. So I I follow the the guild definition of this, which is EA as a collection of domains, business architecture, and then IT architecture made up of app data tech or security or whatever you put in that. Right, I will totally let you opine on that. So I see it as all, of course, recognizing that some organizations have an EA role, right? A role that plays across those, um, perhaps with the T or V shape uh, focus, but I see enterprise architecture as all those disciplines, but, but please, please opine on that one. Yeah. I, I, I put it that way, whether we go into domains or layers of the architecture, business architecture and technology architecture and in between information, data or security or infrastructure. So platform, and then there are some technology specific cloud architect or other things come into play as well. So I think it really depends on the internally organization, how they wired their uh, enterprise architecture practice and operating model. And uh, if there's a role is, is a business focus EA, that could go as well. Uh, and then the IT focus role as well, uh, as well uh, EA could happen if they don't fit into traditional architecture layers and domains. Uh, I, I think I could see a case, but I haven't seen that thing happening in practice where a, maybe a smaller team, when you can't afford to have a, all the domain architects, so maybe a, one side could be the business facing enterprise architect, another would be might be IT facing enterprise architect, and then they're working together to bridge a gap. So that's another way of looking at that, but I haven't seen that in practice happening. Uh, awesome. more questions. Sorry, it's great. So, I'm gonna, uh, I think, uh, so I think it depends on the maturity of the organization to relation to the architecture. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's absolutely. Right. Yep, yeah. I think spot on. Uh, interesting about the roles, uh, the usual view of the enterprise architect is an IT role, business architect, uh, fairly new in the market, just in my experience. So, so that's a comment coming from there. Uh, yeah, any sometime, I mean, you and I have been in this business for over 10 plus years or 10, 15 years. 
So mm-hmm. um, I would say that, yes, originated enterprise architecture in the IT, but then the business architecture came along to stretch it to the business. It, uh, and, that's well said, yeah. And I think one, one thing I also uh, have seen in certain organization in my own experience, sometime uh, the different domain architects, especially business architect, they sit in the business. So the why, the reason is that so the business architect role becoming so important now because they hold the business knowledge based on their uh, stakeholders, because they have the holistic view of the business somehow in the, the domain they were working on. So you might have a customer area with the customer business architect, or there might be other finance side or financial services, financial part domain business architect. So, so I think that's kind of things I'm seeing happening as well in the industry to mm-hmm. in the larger organization where it's very hard for a business architect to conceptualize and being able to understand the whole business. Imagining you have about 30 plus business areas. So mm-hmm. that could be a really challenge. And business mm-hmm. architect placed in the business could in a way to have kind of a contain the knowledge uh, power. So, yep, so uh, over to you. Uh, there's another question for you. I'm a business <laughs> architect. <laughs> Could I, could I just comment on, I think you made some really important points on the state of business architecture mm-hmm. and it really come into its own and formalized over, you know, the guild was founded in 2010, right? But but that Venn diagram is actually so important because um, I, I always, you know, that, that phrase, the future is here, just unevenly distributed. That's the state of business architecture where we do see more and more teams uh, business architecture teams, they're reporting to strategy and transformation leaders, and they they work enterprise level and the business architecture is enterprise level. I think that's a really important point to make that enterprise, and we have ways of getting our hands around the enterprise, even if business architects also report in domains. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think well said. Uh, thanks for connecting that. So, uh, yeah, so another comment is there about there. I'm a business architect. But my title is EA, as the organization does not recognize business architecture. When we have seen this happening, people take, uh, yeah, that kind of a role, and then maybe that's the need for the business only at that stage. Yeah, and and I think when that's the case, you still show up business focused. And I see if I love the the point you drew out around business outcomes before. No matter what we're called, or you know, we're still going to make sure that we're all rallied around the business and ultimately achieving those outcomes. Yeah. That's great. I will make the final comment and wouldn't hold you on that, but then we can keep marching and we can take a discussion as we go. So what I, another comment came from, what I see is enterprise creating new roles due to its lack of maturity. People are already, already uh, their roles are already there. Uh, what's needed is a change in the operating model and organization structure. I think it's a spot on comment. Right. And right. Uh, and I think there's some other comments are coming up as well, but I will not hold you. I will probably take you, let you do that. And then we will keep doing that. Yeah. Okay. I'll let Got you wrap it. up. <laughs> All right. So kind of taking now from the golden thread and just the reminder that capabilities, again, that's sort of the Rosetta Stone, right? That's um. That's how we're gonna connect the dots. So we can see if different business units, initiatives, right, work are focusing on making changes and improvements to the same capability. And then we can, in our knowledge base, get the collective view of, for example, who should be at the table to set direction with this capability, or can we leverage um, a solution that's already available for what we're trying to do? Or should we be building a shared one? Or is there already an initiative in flight uh, that we can, that we can depend on. Um, what other capabilities are dependent uh, that do we need for this? And what's the collective impact on stakeholders? So really in summary, and then I will turn it over to you, Asif, you know, the benefits of, of leveraging architecture to underpin strategy to execution is we can bring the enterprise perspective on making decisions. So what's what's best for the enterprise, what's best for the customer or constituent and balance that with the needs of our silos and other perspectives. We can effectively communicate direction throughout all layers of the organization with clarity and actionable context, right? Framed by the architecture so people know how they fit in and what they need to do. 
And we can, and organizations do, orient business ownership. And this is a big shift, right? We shift business ownership and investment around capabilities and value streams. Um, and that might involve one executive or multiple executives doing that together. And then the initiatives deliver enhancements to those capabilities in value stream context. We can get a lot more synergy around reuse, modularity um, of, as we design. We can assess collective impact of, of change on stakeholders, like I said, across all the things that we're doing. We can ensure that ongoing alignment of strategy, architecture, initiative, and replan when we need and implement change quickly and cohesively from end to end, which is, again, that competitive advantage or the way that we best achieve our missions. So with that, Asif, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, uh, and uh, thanks for laying a foundation for me and making a life a little bit easier for me so I can speak a little bit further on from there where you left. Uh, adaptability. My, my focus has been on agility and adaptability in the last probably maybe 15, 20 years. And really what I realized that when we talk about agility or adaptability, we probably first thing comes into mind, okay, Scrum or scaled agile or something else kind of thing iteratively doing all these things, but essentially it's about adaptability. Uh, not a process should be adaptive, but whatever the design, like architecture, business design, what are we doing? There needs to be adaptive as well. So that's where I really focus on adaptive enterprise architecture and adapting to change. That's where the, where the adaptability comes into play. And if you're looking into that, this quadrant, uh, we can look at that. There are two sides of the adaptability change for uh, uh, making things faster, quicker, making more uh, uh, optimized, efficient. So that's my left side of it, focus on routine change and continuous improvement, let it changes. And then on my right side, it's more about radical changes where you are adding new products, services, or, or infrastructure experiences to, to your portfolio. So it's a growth. And then you are, it means creating new things, innovation point of view, or sometimes you do the existing thing in a different way or offer a different way. That's also transformation as well, which is innovation. So really adapting to change for me is that you are continuously optimizing and continuously innovating uh, uh, as well. And there might be for different reasons uh, uh, for, for that, you maybe keep uh, keeping or containing your product leadership or operational excellence or customer intimacy. So balancing these three things, value disciplines across the adaptability. There's a more stuff into it, probably my book published some time ago, but new book is, has that stuff as well. Uh, but yeah, that's where here we're really laying the foundation. Uh, when we're talking about adaptive enterprise architecture, we're looking at architecture, which is by design adaptable and adaptable to the change. We know that large monolithic or large kind of enterprises, even making a small change is very hard. So it's not the capability of the project manager or delivery team, uh, uh, but rather the design is so much in a way done uh, in a complex way, it's the organization is uh, it's becoming harder to adapt or very expensive to adapt or make small changes even. So thinking change or adaptability first is for me is important when I'm looking at the design point of view. Uh, so adaptation or adaptability is a new kind of a quality requirement when you're looking at the uh, adaptive uh, enterprise architecture. Uh, maybe next slide, uh, Wendy, if that's okay. Uh, yep. Another thing in this uh, 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 session, we'll be looking at that the adaptive enterprise architecture as information. So I call that design as information or architecture as information. So what is information? So really, it's really looking at the focus on collecting your design data. We always uh, look at that when we do the architecture, we're looking at those big PowerPoints or, or boxes and arrows or big architect models and all these things, all they are great. But really behind the scene, there are data. If we have the data, actual data, and we can feed into our analytics and intelligence capabilities, they produce information. I know some of the people might disagree with me over here. The, there's a traditional data information, knowledge and intel, intelligence kind of a pyramid. But for me, anything processes an information and that can feed into our decisions whether to adapt to change or not. So that's really as an architect, what I see my role is, has been in the last 10, 15 years is that how I help the stakeholders
stakeholders, provide them the right information so they can make decision. So me, so enterprise architecture or business architecture or what we, Mandy and I were talking about uh, tonight, connecting architecture to data for intelligence strategies is all about is how our disciplines are decision support systems or decision for support frameworks. So if I substitute an architecture framework, framework name with something else, I will call that is a decision support framework. So totally different kind of a conversation when you have this with the business or IT, because we are helping people to make decision, uh, not necessarily at the strategic level only, but also tactical and operational levels as well. So it means embedding architecture information in the rest of the organization. So everybody can become an architect in the sense of they have that information when they need it for the decision-making at their level. Um, we can go next slide. Questions, if you would like to take them. Sure, sure, absolutely. We can, we can. There was we can a, take. a good point on your last slide, actually. Great picture. Does it make sense to align the strategic initiatives within each cluster? And I'll just go back here for a second. That was on this one. Uh, I, I think spot on. Someone picked up. I use this grid as a, a, a mapping, overlaying the strategic initiatives. Uh, investment portfolio, you can see that if you overlay your investment portfolio in this grid, you can see that how many initiatives are focused on the keeping the lights on, like the routine changes, and how many initiatives of amount of money or stuff is focused on the continuous improvement and the transformation and growth. By overlaying on these four quadrants, you can clearly can tell what kind of a company culture is there. Are there more innovative growth-oriented company or they're more focused let's say their efforts into the keeping the lights on, just pushing the things through. So great question. Uh, I use that grid for those purposes to uh, overlay a lot of stuff around there. Fantastic. And, and another one, how do you ensure the same adaptive capability across the various teams? In other words, infrastructure and code development? I think uh, each, uh, uh, if we look at the enterprise value chain, uh, uh, enterprise value chain, uh, within that, there are different teams and different capabilities. I would say that embedding those adaptive ability principles and being able to have information, let's say information enabled, not driven, let's say information enabled decision and to identify the changes and also to uh, respond to those changes. I think that's where the key is that. So for me, is that it is important uh, if I look at that, the whole, wherever the teams are, whether teams in infrastructure or team in the strategy or team in the ops or team in the, in the middle somewhere, architecture team or in the risk area or the vendor management area, if the information is available to enable to, to help them to make decision and being able to adapt, that's the key, uh, which can be, uh, there's another thing I will share towards the end of this slide pack, uh, which I call uh, architecture to operations pipeline. So in that, uh, how you take the architecture and take it through all the way to operationalize it in between what are the teams available are, there's a whole information pipeline, architecture information available to them for their needs and purposes. In, in a sleep, I think an interesting point um, on this picture, the flow should really be the core of the new EA tools, I think is an insightful point as well. Yes, so, yes. <laughs> That's right. I think we're, we're going gonna, gonna to mention some of the tools probably later on as well. So yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep. Happy to take further. Otherwise, we can keep probably maybe moving on. So now if I combine the adaptability and information, so the EA becomes a middle part, adaptive EA as information. So you can uh, craft and draft your layers as you like. But really, when I look at something, if I look at the human-centric approach, I, I think humans they interact with each other, they interact with the technology within certain facility or environment, and then they want to make sure they're secure and safe when well, that's what they're doing. So this is all for me architecture, making the complex things simple, focus on the human, and all those layers are human. Humans interactions with the technology facility within the environment, making sure those interactions and the humans, are, everything is at the secure and safe, and that's what is the architecture for me is that. And collecting the data across these layers, so it means each layer of the architecture becomes a architecture data domain, and then being able to analyze and interpret 
those things and then being able to decide and respond uh, and then for adaptability. So this loop keeps going on. So it's not about static models or diagram. It's about more about collecting the data across those layers of domains and analyze them using different tools and stuff. So it's really a scan and sensing kind of a architecture. And that's where you uh, turn, take your data, turn into information, further information and keep going. We can go to the next slide if that's okay. Uh, we don't have much time tonight to go into deep into the frameworks, but I'm probably going to leave it to, uh, uh, I work with different frameworks and different uh, uh, models and tools and stuff. Uh, not necessarily this framework which I'm presenting to you is a replacement of the existing framework. It's a meta framework. It means within that, you can plug in TOGAF, BizBook, uh, uh, ITIL, COBIT, uh, uh, and then other frameworks as well as you like. But really what I, realize when I practice architecture, I found a uh, few things really important. One, I do the design. And the second thing is that I use the practice to design that architecture. So in the design, what I have at the very, very basic level, I have principles. And then there's a meta model of data, which I wanna manage about my architecture. And those metadata is managed across different layers. Some of the layers I showed on the last slide. So this is really for me a very bare bone design and you can add more things to it. And then I need a capability your team to deliver that design. And this architecture pipeline, continuous delivery pipeline of the architecture, services, products, and other things. So these are two things are for me to simplify when I look at that, uh, uh, any kind of a enterprise architecture work. You can adapt any framework around there. You can pull the uh, BizBox meta model around here, or you can pull the uh, TOGAF meta model or the meta model, but the meta model, which in the adaptive EA framework, the way I constructed it, which I will share with you, that is managed as a knowledge graph. It means you are not limited to the number of entities you can have that, rather you can have a connection oriented approach to construct your meta model. I will share in the next few slides about uh, what is a knowledge graph and uh, how we meta model capturing that. Okay. Um, so this is a bit of a description of those layers. If you can look at that, actors and interfaces. So our architecture normally sometimes starts with the IT or sometimes with non-IT things, but really it start, I believe, if something things are static, then people less likely to worry about it. But when people start interacting, then you're really looking at the transactions happening. So that's a very, First is an interaction architecture layer, where you're really looking at the different actors and interfaces and how they interact with the rest of the layers. And look at the human layer, you have the business oriented, non-technology, human layer. And how I came about about these things, if you look at the simple uh, coffee shop business, right? As a human, they do business. Let's say they buy or sell coffee. When they do that, they let's say they share information about the coffee, money, brand, what coffee are needed. And then also they socialize it, right? Uh, they maybe like the coffee, share, or maybe they have a loyalty card around there somewhere, go on a Facebook of the coffee shop. So really it, it, it's a kind of a social interaction they do as well, apart from doing their business, meeting with the family and all. And then they have professional capabilities as well. Like they're certified to do certain thing. If, if a person making coffee or certain area, they're working in trade, they need to have a certification around there. So that's how the humans are made of. So my, all the work is around, okay, what humans they do and then architecting around them. And then that humans are enabled by technology, application data and other thing and the facility data center and other stuff and, and the layer of security around that. Uh, we can go on and on, but having time limitation, I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but just giving a little glimpse of that, uh, the, some of the reasoning and this is a thinking developed over a period of the last 10, 15 years. Didn't happen overnight, but that was my reflection of the practice and work I do. Inesif, before you move on question, would sure. you consider a human first EA layer, the psychology layer slash behaviors? Uh, absolutely. And if you're looking at the social side of it, that's probably a lot of things will fit into there. And, uh, and, and the social behavior, which is the social processes around there and the mindset they have. So really this social asterisk, which I call extended layers, uh, that's absolutely different. Without social, then it means robots can do a job for you. They can do the business. They can move things around for you. 
They can manage information for you. But really the socialization team, robots not gonna have another robot hanging out there and having a cigarette or smoke, right? Or having a drink. So, so we, or, or the way we behave, right? The corridor chats. So I hope I answered that question. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So let, let's, let's jump to, um, to a pipeline. That was a layer. The pipeline is very, again, my whole focus was when I look at the architecture as a complex discipline, how can it make simpler? So for me, architecture is a continuous discovery in the middle. You can see that. And discovery within the some certain vision and scope. And the architecture data is being discovered, model, and then we prioritize it and then we implement it. And then across the whole, this pipeline, uh, we look at the governance and adaptation of that architecture data and the design and everything. And then we're pulling into ESG and SES goals as well to ensuring our architecture is sustainable and good for the world and social stuff as well. And one more thing about there, when we're executing this pipeline, uh, you're looking at the pipeline execution, maybe a time box manner. So that's where the vision and scope comes into play. Uh, whether it's a quarterly cycle or six month cycle depends on the industry and business you are in. And the more volatile business may be a quicker cycles of the pipeline where the more stable businesses or more like the air, aircraft manufacturing industry, they might have a more stable. They don't churn out the aircraft every three months or, or the feature like the product we, in other businesses we do. So it depends on uh, your asset life cycle uh, when you're going through this pipeline. And it's not about the big architecture or just in time or minimum viable. I would say that we need to look at the, what is minimum information is required uh, by your stakeholders to make decision and have value. So that's really important. Extra information too much or too low is not important. So really a minimum required architecture is about for me is a minimum required information required for value delivery. We can jump to the next slide, Randy, if you like, and then we can look at the questions. So that's the interesting part. So I was working a few years ago, I think it was 2014 with one of the bank. And then I think long story short, uh, the project came along about uh, uh, connecting operations to the architecture for operational resilience point of view. And then I think that's where I discovered something called RCOPS. So your operations are your current state. Whatever you're operating in your environment, in business or environment, that's your current execution, that's the current state. So why don't we use that data and pull back and understand that's our current state rather than having a trying to do a lot of workshops and stuff and then define a current state. And by the time you define the current state over a period of three to six months, <laughs> operations have moved further. So your current state, but you document it just becomes invalid or not really correct picture, not complete at least. So really using operations information back to architecture design, managing that the history for strategic decision point of view, and then simulating and forecasting the future as well of the architecture information. And that's where the RCOPS is about. Uh, uh, these are DevOps you already know about, but RCOPS is really turning architecture to operation and operation to architecture kind of a loop. And I will share with you how it is done or how it was done. And that is one in the next slide. So when, so here is a little example of that. You can see my left or right, my right side is ops. Uh, you might be using different framework or capabilities and uh, operations, CBDs, CMDBs and stuff. Where my, my left side, we have a different frameworks you have, Toga, Bizbook, and others. As I said, my framework is more about meta framework. And I make use of Togaf, good elements, uh, Wendy's work in Bizbook or other people. So I'm, I'm really looking at picking the things which I can plug in uh, the meta framework and the approach. So in the RCOPS information pipeline is all about connecting your architecture repository all the way to ops. And that's with the two-way information, RCOPS information pipeline. If you can establish that, make that available, that would be a really, really gold for allowing the people to make operational decision at the operational level. And the further on the left side, people might be interested in more strategic kind of decision or in between project delivery or uh, program delivery, people might be interested in a tactical level of decision making. So this pipeline can help us out uh, between sharing information, architecture operations. And that's really a key, uh, what, we, uh, uh, what I found out from that project learning and further expanded on that. 
And here uh, you can use, you can see that there are different tool sets around here. You can do service uh, now around here. You can use here, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 Evo, uh, Evo, uh, Abacus from Evolution. You can use uh, Jalapeno. You can use uh, iServer. Mega, I'm not, I'm not restricting anything. You can also plug in around here, not only CMDBs, but also your operational data coming from your business capabilities. Let's say your CRM data, uh, your, uh, your maybe uh, manufacturing another kind of a data, finance data or HR data. You can pull that data as well and map to your business capabilities or architecture stuff. And you can see that how much difference it would make. So essentially when I talk about the ArcOps, I talk about the ArcScopes information pipeline where it connects architecture to operation and back and forth. I think we can take questions here, uh, Wendy, if that's okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna take them a, a tiny bit out of order, but the first yes. one is, is architecture repository analogous to what we call the business architecture knowledge base? Uh, I think it, uh, it's, it's all up to uh, you how you want to manage that uh, architecture repository. If you want to just focus on the business architecture point of view, yes, you can have define the business architecture meta model or, or, or model and then start managing that information. But for me, architecture repository is all encompassing thing about the architecture knowledge, about your design knowledge or design information. Right on. And, and what is the non-technology equivalent of the CMDB, in other words, for, uh, for, the, for the business architecture? I would say that, put it that way, these are the business operations. And business operations are very much nowadays tied up or tangled with IT. It's like a twin brother, right? Hard to separate some time. So for me, uh, it's a CMDB, we call configuration management database, but really these are the business operations. And CMDB is one of the systems which provide certain kind of a capabilities to monitor and manage your operations and any incidents and problems and changes, uh, uh, your operating environment information, where things are. But then again, you can add more your business operation like CRM system, Salesforce, right? Or SAP or uh, other kind of system which are managing your actual business thing that can plug in as well. So I would say if I add another one, I will add CMDB plus other business operations databases or systems. Perfect. And for that ArcOps vision, what type of data should be then inside the CMDB? Okay. I would say CMDB uh, can focus on traditionally what's the call uh, CMDB models coming from ITIL or some other places, but then it can be integrated uh, or powered with the other business system as well. So I would say that uh, uh, the architecture repository meta model or, or model can be similarly have a common elements around there as well. But certainly there's some operation related instance problems, changes, and the uh, uh, operational data monitoring, the usage, all the things can be stay in the operations database because that's what you don't need over there in architecture repository. Architecture repository more about the design information. This is about design and execution information. Perfect. I can certainly recommend a couple of tools. Apologies, Wendy, on speaking over. Uh, Operations DB, I'm not any vendor kind of a pushing kind of, I'm just giving an example. It could be a service now. Uh, it's a very good uh, uh, configuration management database over there. It helps you to do operational uh, impact analysis and stuff as well. And there's a Dynatrace and other places as well. So there are many. Uh, it's, it's just your choice. And the architecture repository, again, you can have many platform I already mentioned. Great. You want to take one more? Sure. Mm -hmm. Configuration items in CMDBs when applied to business would perhaps fall under business capabilities? Okay. That's a very, very interesting question. I, okay. The business capability, I always call this an internal capability view. But then the, being that capability then linked to the service, business service. So we can have in the architecture repository, business capability information, but then that links to the business services, which are being used by the end user. And those business services, and that exactly the project which I did with the bank, we map the business services in the CMDB and then link back to the capabilities in the architecture repository. So you have a 
capability which is delivering service uh, uh, and used by uh, the, uh, the end user. So, and mm -hmm. then you can map from CMDB services, business services, back to the capabilities in the architecture repository. And that's really the arc of linking is. And could the architecture repository be a combination of an EA tool and a DTO, digital twin of an, of an organization? Absolutely, absolutely. Because it's all about architecture is a, as information is all about you have the physical environment or physical things, you turn into data or digital, and then you can start managing analytics and all kind of thing to turn into information and stuff. So absolutely, uh, both I would say architecture repository and ops CMDBs that they could be considered as a digital twin of the physical environment you have. Um, on that note, uh, one thing I wanted to mention here, uh, it, 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 there's a mapping or integration challenge, which I can discuss next slide. And that's where we can have a unified model, uh, maybe a later slide probably, <laughs> but I will, I will talk about that uh, in a minute. Uh, we can have a knowledge graph to represent the common model between CMDB, uh, architecture repository, and also other business operation systems. And I'll talk probably after this one. So let's look at this one. Traditionally, when we talk about architecture modelings, you look at the, uh, the big list of architecture models, if you look at that way, and then different views and viewpoints. That's great. But really for architecture as information, we're looking at the architecture information model. So we're looking at the modeling, the architecture data. And that's where I would say the data knowledge graph come into play. Then turn that data into analytics using analytics capabilities, enterprise analyze with data intelligence capabilities, machine learning, AI, and then make that information available for making adaptation or decision-making. And that you can pull, put that information into decision tables and other things as well. And then making some action for a certain performance scheme. That's what I call outcome or impact driven approach to architecture. So how I start normally, I go from uh, front to back. I identify first information needs in the adaptation uh, area. And then I can go about what data I need to collect to turn that into information so I can help the business. So really the key over here is that you identify the architecture information catalog and decision catalog the information is there, but what decision are we going to make? So I'll start the adaptation first approach and then go all the way, go to the data and come back here. Does, does, it, does it resonate to you uh, or does it make sense in some sense? I'm quite fast going. <laughs> but... Okay. So may, maybe we can jump to the next one. Yep. So traditionally, we can have a digital twin. We can say the physical before the Archimedes conceptual model. So still, we can use Archimedes or stuff like that to do the conceptual modeling. But then we turn that into a data or data knowledge graph or something, and then feed that to analytics and AI machine learning, and then feed into our decision models for happening the uh, uh, making a decision and stuff. So that's the kind of a different modeling tools and approaches you use when you consider adaptive EA as information. A little bit of different thinking compared to the static modeling of the Archimedes only. Uh, but I do like Archimedes as well because it provides me the initial understanding. When I run my Miro board workshops with the stakeholders and stuff, so I normally use uh, sticky notes. So sometimes if the people are Archimedes savvy, Archimedes in that symbols and stuff to model the architecture and then turn into data and other stuff. We can go to the next slide, Randy. I know we have finished the time, but let's make up. So these are some of the tools you can see on my right side or my left side. And uh, really we need to identify what are the architect question or stakeholder decision or action needs are. And based on that, we go back and then look at the architecture information viewpoints and views. Uh, and these are different tools that can support that to do that. Maybe we can, Randy, go next. Apologies, uh, I took a bit of time. So this is a common model, uh, which I call architecture information in, in a knowledge graph view, which have, so architecture is all about the data and uh, about the objects or things and their connections. So you can see that here in the blue side, actor is a part of the value network or ecosystem. So this is kind of a, what they call object and subject and with the predicate in the middle or relationship. So that's how you can define your common uh, 
uh, enterprise knowledge graph for architecture, and that can point to the different repositories, including architecture repository, operation repository, CRM, and other places. So this becomes your knowledge graph, a meta layer or, or a semantic layer for your enterprise architecture. And that can help you to discover and query the underlying repositories. So that's a fabric, enterprise architecture, knowledge fabric or, or, or a graph. And then the, maybe you can do the next slide. I believe that's probably going to be the it. So that's pretty much for the it. I, it was very quick uh, to share with that what is architecture as information. Uh, but uh, I will say in our next presentation, probably maybe in the next episode or so, I will probably discuss our corpse pipeline, how those different tools come together and sharing some example as well. So, so on that note, we can, I know the chat, a lot of questions are there. Happy to take a few questions uh, before we disappear. Many over to you as well now. Absolutely. And I think um, it looks like most of them have been uh, resolved, either answered earlier or some of uh, some of everybody's kind of chatting with each other. So I, I think we can probably close here. We will make the recording available, slides available. And of course, we're happy to continue the dialogue and any questions after the session are welcome as well. So just a huge thanks to everyone and to you, Asif, really. Thank you really very good. much. Thank you very much, everyone. We apologize for running over, but um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Here's, great... here's our contact. Sorry, go on. Yeah, just have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully we catch up again. Thank you very much. Thank you.